And there was no chance this bird, I was never concerned that it was, I was going to lose it or anything because it just wanted to be with me all the time. So I started to go outside with it and it would fly into the trees and the branches, but I had this whistle that I would whistle for it and it would come back. It was crazy. And and I remember I'd be walking around the campus with this bird on my shoulder. It was the craziest thing. And it could fly away and then I could whistle and it would come back and and it just became part of my life and it was just so powerful. Swirling around me are thoughts about last year, what worked and what didn't. During the last part of 2021, I became ridiculously overextended. I had so many obligations, things like teaching creativity workshops, art shows to prepare for, and even launching this podcast. Don't get me wrong, everything I was involved in was amazing. But from where I am sitting now, having gotten through, I intend to do a better job at keeping things more spacious in 2022. But I've also learned something regarding a particular downside to having been busy for so many months. One of the most remarkable aspects of being an artist, being us, is that we're super sensitive. We feel things strongly maybe more than most. If the music is too loud, the color's not right, or someone or someplace just doesn't feel right, we have to leave. Our intuition just lets us know. So what happens when you're super busy, the artist's gift, the sensitivity, the presence required to notice what is actually presenting itself, whether it is uh, you know, opportunities, clues, or chance meetings with those that might help us on our way in, in our life and art, well, all of that can be missed. If we're not present, we miss crucial things necessary for our journey. I remember early on always feeling so much and wishing I didn't. But at one point, I realized this sensitivity wasn't a handicap, but something that made me especially suited to making things, to being an artist, to being awake, to discover things, and to find and chase the adventures that were unfolding around me. I learned that this particular sensitivity was what made everything possible. So today I wanna to tell you the story of how I, many years ago, came to accept and embrace this innate sensitivity within myself. My hope is this might remind you to savor and appreciate this aspect of yourself as well. Oddly, this reframe wasn't something I learned from any of my teachers. It didn't come from making art or working especially hard, although at the time I was doing a ton of both. It came from a chance meeting with a bird a wild baby crow. Welcome to Art to Life, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight the wild frontiers of art making and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. So I was an art student at the University of Santa Barbara in California, and I got into the school really on the strength of my art and my grades in academics were not very good. So I always felt a little like even though I got in, I had kind of gotten in the back door and kind of wondered whether I really fit in. First year or so was kind of hard and I was in an art program and didn't really find my people. And I just felt pretty sensitive to all manner of things going on around me, not feeling like I was fitting in, socially or doing so well in art. I just hadn't found my groove and I tried to be different and, you know, do all the things that increase my social activity, but nothing really worked. And I just kind of settled into just sort of being in it. And I remember I was riding my bike home one night and I was riding through the woods on this bike path and I noticed something out of the corner of my eye and it was on the ground and it was this little black bundle that <laughs> looked like a squirrel or something, you know, and 
I don't know. I, I don't know what made me pull over and sort of stop my bike and walk across the eucalyptus leaves and kind of like look closer. It was sun was going down. So it was kind of dark. And it turned out it was a baby bird. And I, I don't know why I noticed it or why I would even, I mean, lots of animals are in the woods kind of thing, but it was something about this bird that it was all alone and at night time was coming and it was kind of just sitting there. Like it had decided that like nothing, no bird was around it. It was, it couldn't fly. And so I ended up deciding to help this bird (laughs) and I kind of scooped it up and I put it in my sweater and I put it in the bike basket and I rode back to my apartment and I sort of researched this and discovered that, well, this, this bird was a crow, a baby crow. And in these eucalyptus trees that you could often hear crows were all the nests. And when in a nest, there's always one of the birds, you know, there's two or three baby birds. One's usually a runt and one is usually pushed out of the nest by the others. It's like the weak one is basically killed because the others are stronger and there's more food for them. And usually the bird will hit a branch on the way down or, you know, it's not going to last. So that was what this bird was. It was a runt. And somehow it had landed in the leaves and wasn't killed when, when I found it. So anyway, I started to figure out how to feed this bird. And I learned how to do that. And I went to the pet store and I got mealworms and this bird was really hungry. And it was interesting because I kind of forgot a lot about my own problems, you know, just like I was suddenly (laughs) this mother bird, you know, and I had to get up really early and get to the pet store in Santa Barbara and figure this out. And I just felt hugely responsible for this thing. And it didn't take long, but this bird completely glommed onto me. I mean, I was the, became the mother bird and it would eat tons and tons of these mealworms. I mean, it's just constantly, and it would crow for me. And, and I kept it in my apartment and we weren't allowed to have pets in there, but, you know, so I tried to kind of keep it in the bathroom where it's, it's screaming, wouldn't it's, it's, you know, its noise wouldn't be heard. And, you know, in soon it, it just kept growing and it was, you know, a week or two and it was thriving and it completely, I became its parent and this thing would sit on my arm. It, it wouldn't leave me. I mean, I could walk anywhere and it would follow me around on the floor. Eventually it started to be able to fly a little bit and it could fly from the table onto my arm, you know, and and I was always just feeding it, you know, and there was no chance this bird, I was never concerned that it was, I was going to lose it or anything because it just wanted to be with me all the time. So I started to go outside with it and it would fly into the trees and the branches, but I had this whistle that I would whistle for it and it would come back. It was crazy. And and I remember I'd be walking around the campus with this bird on my shoulder. It was the craziest thing. And it could fly away and then I could whistle and it would come back. And and it just became part of my life. And it was just so powerful. And what I was learning by looking after this bird and it sort of became like my companion at a time when um, I, I didn't have a lot of people that I was really connecting with. This bird was kind of, kind of fulfilled that. So school year ends and summer comes and I've, it's time to like leave and come back to the Bay Area near San Francisco, Marin County for the summer. So I just remember driving home with my hand on the steering wheel and this bird in the car on my arm for eight hours driving home, you know, and the sun's going down and it's me. And I named the bird Joe. It was Joe the Crow. And it was really great. It was just, it was like having the the coolest companion. And I had told my parents about this and no one really got it. Or it's like, are you, what are you doing (laughs) with this bird? You know? And so I got home and they, they were kind of blown away. And this bird 
you know, I said, listen, it's, it, it likes to sleep, um, in my room and, and sometimes actually outside. And there was this tree out in my yard outside my kind of old bedroom window. And it was kind of summer. So it was warm and Joe would sit outside on the tree branch and I'd leave my window open and he would sleep there and I would sleep in my bed. And then in the morning at like 5 a.m., as soon as all the birds started chirping, I would feel Joe would fly in and he would land on my chest and I was asleep, but I would kind of wake up and I could feel his feet on my chest (laughs) and I would just slightly crack my eyes open and he would just be, he would just be standing, staring at me, you know, like his beak about an inch away from my nose, just full on eyes riveted on me. And if he noticed that I was awake, like he wouldn't say anything, he would just wait. But if he saw that I was looking at him, he would start like squawking like a, a you know a teenager bird would do because he's hungry you know and he would just be screaming for his food <laughs> and I would have to like get up and go upstairs to the refrigerator and get the container of mealworms and come back down and feed him right then and there because he was so hungry anyway it was just the coolest thing and he he started to fly around the neighborhood and uh, there was uh, some neighbors who there was a pool up there and he kind of made friends with the kids next door, you know, and they would feed him strawberries. And but Joe always would come back, you know, and I would whistle and he could be miles away, you know, I mean, he could be far up the neighborhood and he'd hear that whistle and he'd come flying down and come back. I didn't know really how to raise a bird or where this all was going, but it was it was just the most lovely experience and, and having this companionship. And I remember one time my dad had this sailboat. We were, did a lot of sailing on the San Francisco Bay and he wanted me to help him, but I couldn't leave Joe. And he said, you know, listen, you got to like get a life, you know, like this is just a wild bird and, you know, it's, it's going to move on or, you know, like I need your help. And I said, well, listen, I'll, I'll come down to Sausalito with you, but look, Joe's fine. He can come and he'll just hang out on the boat and um, while we're varnishing or whatever, and, you know, that way I can feed him. And, you know, everyone kind of in my life was a little, you know, I don't know. They just, they didn't really get it. They didn't really s- sort of understand what the attraction was here that, to this bird. So we go down to Sausalito and there's this, uh, it's very, it's very windy down there. And we're in the harbor and we're varnishing this boat and there's so many seagulls and people and it was windy and there's just a lot, a ton and ton of activity going on. And, but Joe sat on the pier, you know, kind of where our boat was anchored and he was there, you know, pretty much the whole time. And then I, I noticed that towards the end of the day, he had flown somewhere, you know, and so I whistled and, but he didn't come back. And I, I think it was hard for him to hear the whistle because there was traffic noises and all this wind and all these seagulls and people and commotion and sailboats coming in and, you know, boat horns going off. And so I was starting to get nervous because he would always come back. And I knew that he didn't know how to feed himself. So if he didn't come back, then he would most certainly die. And and this is what I was so scared of happening. So I'm walking up and down the dock. It's getting later and later. You know, my dad's getting kind of impatient. He was impatient about the whole thing, kind of skeptical about this whole bird anyway, and just what, what I was doing. But I'm like, no, I got to find him. So I walk the main streets called Bridgeway and I'm walking up and down Bridgeway and I'm whistling and looking everywhere and there's pigeons and seagulls and and there's just no sight of this bird and I'm, I don't even know where to look. So I go back to the boat and we're hanging out there longer and longer and my dad's getting more and more impatient and he's it was almost like, you know what, just good riddance, you know, like get on with your life and uh, have a summer and don't 
keep canceling things and you, you need to move on and, you know, be more social. And so I leave, you know, I, we move, we carry the stuff to the car from the boat. It's freezing cold and all this, we make several trips and I'm just, the whole time I'm doing it, I'm like, come on, Joe. And I keep whistling, you know, and we put the stuff in the car and, um, but he doesn't show up. So we start the car and we're leaving uh, the harbor and we're driving down the main road. And I'm just, I got my window down and I'm looking everywhere for this bird as we're driving out of Sausalito. And my home was about three or four miles away. Like this bird's not going to figure it out. Like we're, we're leaving him in a place he doesn't even know. It wasn't like my neighborhood. And so I'm looking up on the buildings. I'm looking in the trees. I'm looking on the ground. I'm looking, you know, every bird that flies by, I think it's him. You know, I'm looking for other crows. And as we're leaving Sausalito, I look up way, way up in the sky. Sausalito is like a, it's like the Riviera, you know, it's a beautiful seaside coastal town. Have you ever been there? And it's on a steep hill. And it's several thousand feet of, of hillside and cliffs before, you know, that, that go up from Sausalito that are dotted with houses and trails. And it's this really spectacular to live on this, on these cliff hills and overlook the bay is, it's just breathtaking. But I look up in the sky, like way, way up, like past these cliffs and these hills, far, far up in the sky. And I see these little specks. It's a flock of birds. And I, and I became pretty attentive to what crows look like from a distance. You know, I, I was tracking crows. <laughs> um, and so I, I knew they were crows, but there was like 30 of them, you know, and they're just flying up in the wind way up there. And I'm like, dad, 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 stop the car, stop the car. And he's like, look, I can't stop. You know, we're going home. So I wind down the window. We were in a traffic jam. The cars were all stopped. And I wind down the window and I stand up in the car and I whistle. I, I do this whistle. It's this really high pitched whistle. And I, you know, kind of do a call around my mouth. And I do this whistle repeatedly like there's no way I mean, these birds were so far away. But I'm just screaming this whistle as hard as I can. And it was so amazing because one of these little specks, I mean, literally, it was like a pinhead, I see breaks off and it, it closes its wings is what a bird does when it's going to go into a dive. It pulls its wings back. You see this with like peregrines and stuff. Their wings go back. This little thing, this one speck pulls its wings back and it comes flying down <laughs> like a rocket ship, you know, and I'm just watching this, like, is this actually happening? And I'm, I'm banging my arm, which is like the other thing, like keep whistling to, and show this bird where, where I am so it can locate. Cause it, all it can do is hear this high pitch. And I see as it's coming closer and closer, you know, it's at like 500 feet, 400 feet. It's adjusting to the vocalizations that I'm giving to like, you know, so it can figure it out. So this is Joe coming out of another flock of crows, of wild crows, coming back down. And it comes screaming down all the cars behind us in traffic. My dad's like driving. The cars are starting to move. Joe comes screaming down and lands on my arm. And I'm just standing up outside the window of the car as the car's moving. And he comes in and he's just I just couldn't believe it. And he's screaming and screaming. He's hungry. And I grab these worms. The thing I hadn't eaten all afternoon. You know, my dad's just like, couldn't believe it. Like what occurred in the cars behind us. They, everyone was just like, what is going on? You know, and I'll just never forget it. It was just this extraordinary experience of just this bird, how it like came, you know, that I was like rescued from this point, you know, from this day. It was a story that I know it just changed me, but it changed my dad. I mean, he got it. He got how amazing this bond was and what it meant to me and the whole thing, you know, and 
So, you know, we went home and, and it was another month or so. And this bird, Joe hung out and he started to fly. He started to hang out with other crows actually a little bit. You know, that day that I saw him with the other birds was the first time that I had seen him interact with other wild birds. I, I didn't know what the plan was for this bird to grow up. You know, I just knew that I was its mother or father or whatever, right? And so it kept on, it kind of hung out and then it would be with other birds and it would it would sometimes spend longer time away and which sort of felt fine because it would always come back at night and I would feed it and and it seemed less hungry. I, I had marked its leg. I had this band on it so I could recognize it with other birds, you know, and then if I whistled, it would always come. But as it kind of started to kind of find its way and be less dependent on me, I got a little bit more freedom and and didn't actually feel so connected. It was sort of like, this is maybe kind of okay. You know, I, I had sort of, it had grounded me in a certain way. It had given me, I don't know, it wasn't really self-confidence, but it had sort of, it had connected me kind of to, to an aspect of myself that, that I, to that sensitivity that I spoke of earlier and, and how, like, how cool all of this was because I had, was paying attention when I was riding my bike that evening, you know, six to eight months prior. So what happened was I was really into bike touring at the time and I decided to do a bicycle trip back down to Santa Barbara from San Francisco. I decided to leave Joe here and my dad or mom could feed Joe when he needed it. Plus there were other people in the neighborhood that were feeding it by then. So I left and it was remarkable. I was riding my bicycle down there to, because I had sort of fallen in love with a girl down there that (laughs) hadn't really given me the time of day uh, when I was in school, but I couldn't stop thinking about her. And so I wanted to do a bike trip. So that seemed like a good destination regardless. And turns out when I got there, it was, I don't know if I had changed, perhaps I had, but, or she did, but it kind of worked out. And I, you know, became involved with this woman and it was kind of amazing experience and something I'd hoped could have happened. And it kind of did. And Joe kind of went and in the end, just kind of re-entered the wild and didn't stop returning. And, and that was kind of the end of that relationship, but it kind of, you know, walked me into some new ones and, and changed me in the process. It was in the end, what, you know, and I would think back afterwards, why, how did this happen to me and how amazing it was. And, and since then, so many things like this that have happened because of just being sensitive and being aware of, of what's going on around you. And, and really, there's so many possibilities. And, and usually they're, for me anyway, they're never planned. The, the best, most extraordinary things that have happened to me that have formed my art, that have helped me on my way, were things that just that just happened. There was a, definitely a point where there was an invitation. Something's presented itself and really all that happened was I just said yes. And that has made all the difference. So let me know. Uh, I know I'm not alone in these kinds of experiences or just the sort of mir- miracles and serendipity and <laughs> synchronicities that occur, especially for artists. But I will uh, see if I can dig up a photo of uh, this bird. I didn't have many, and I'll, I'll post this on the Art to Life podcast section in the Art to Life website. Also, there's some place to leave some comments and. Uh, Let me know your thoughts and experiences. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. 
the recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolivepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye.